Good morning and welcome to Global Halfcast, brought to you by Global Half Press. In this podcast series, once a week, we bring to you news and views about infectious diseases, vaccines, and vaccination. I am Joe Schmidt, and with me, as always, is Dr. Melvin Senecas. Good morning to Switzerland. Good morning, Melvin. Good morning, Professor Schmidt. Good afternoon, good evening to those who are watching or listening to us today, wherever you may be. Wherever you may be. And what we're covering today is really great stories. Mild flu increases the risk for heart attack and stroke in older patients. Melvin also reports the first fatal case of Alaska pox. He reports about the efficacy of an Ebola vaccine, first documentation ever that it is working. And I cover vaccine-specific adverse events of COVID vaccines. And today, the highlight is Bell's palsy. In addition, we just would like to let you know that the American CDC updated their vaccination recommendations, and you can find the link here on the screen. We don't speak on it today, but we wanted to give you the link. Having said this, Melvin, what is the story with influenza, heart attack, and stroke? Yes, so the risk of heart attack and ischemic stroke in patients 50 years old and above are doubled in the the two weeks after even mild influenza infection, even in people with few risk factors. And this has been reported in a self-controlled case series in the Journal of Infectious Diseases. Um, researchers in Valencia in Spain assessed the link between flu infection diagnosed in the primary care or hospital setting and 90-day risk of heart attack and ischemic stroke in nearly 2.2 million older patients from January 2011 to December 2018. So this is really a, a big, a robust study, right? Looking at a long time of, uh, um, of patients in primary care in hospital setting. And the, the authors noted the growing evidence that respiratory infections, particularly influenza, can trigger or exacerbate cardiovascular diseases, which we know is the world's leading cause of death. And this study provides further evidence that while several pathogens are thought to increase cardiovascular risk through systemic infection and inflammation, the influenza virus may have a more specific role in direct cardiac infection and endothelium dysfunction, leading to destabilization and rupture of existing uh, plaques. So I, I think the, the, the bottom line here is we have influenza, in, uh, influenza vaccines, we know that they work against influenza, influenza infection, and we know that influenza infection increases the risk of stroke and ischemic heart, heart disease in heart attack in older patients. So basically get vaccinated. Very nice story. Uh, I remember similar data from the past. What you show here is very nice, the pathogenesis, so we know why it happens and how it happens. And then from different observational studies, they all show to the same direction. So the big question is, why are patients 50 plus or 60 plus not vaccinated against flu? I mean, if you are a cardiologist, you should protect your patients, right? You, you should do the best to keep them alive and to, to prevent them from having heart attack and stroke. Yeah. I think this should already be in the standard practice of cardiology clinics, cardiology um, centers, yeah. that for people who are 50 and above, you, you need to have your flu vaccine every year. Yeah. Very interesting. I guess, I guess cheap interventions and old interventions play uh, an insufficient role in prevention, whereas all these fancy methods we have today that get highly paid for their people use them and uh, the simple things are forgotten yeah melvin you have another exciting story i mean it is exciting but not nice but maybe you can tell us about it yes so this is um really the first fatal case of alaska pox epidemiologists at the alaska department of health um, this picture by the way is from that website they have reported the first known fatal case of Alaska pox. It's a, no, a novel orthopox virus first identified in 2015. The, the deadly infection involved a man with an underlying health condition living in the Kenai Peninsula. And the infection is the state's seventh Alaska pox case. And it's the first um, 
located outside of the, the area where all these cases were initially um, discovered or reported. And this patient was undergoing cancer treatment. The elderly man's symptoms began in the middle of September last <clears throat> year, a red tender papule in his right uh, armpit. At that time, he was undergoing immunosuppressive therapy as part of cancer treatment. And over the next six weeks, he sought care for the lesion, which worsened. And in November, he was hospitalized for cellulitis that limited movement of his arm. And um, so, and then the, the case worsened. And, and so I, I think it's important to note that Alaska pox uh, exists and it could infect uh, people who are in this area where this virus is known to really circulate. Um, but it's not deadly in people who are immunocompromised because as we know, this is the first case, first fatal case reported. Mm. Well, I, I read that this is uh, in a person who hunted small mammals. Uh, yes. But we don't know which mammal is carrying the virus, right? It is. Well, it well is we know one. that it's it's transmitted by small wild animals, so um, we we can't be sure, right, which one of them. But I I would imagine that those voles and shrews and maybe rats in in that Alaska uh, the forest area, the small mammals could potentially transmit it. Yeah, look, I was vaccinated against smallpox as a child many many years ago. Uh, this patient probably was too young to have received vaccine, and he had cancer, so he was not vaccinated, and he had cancer. And that may contribute to his fatal to the fatal outcome. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I think it's important to to tell our, our viewers or listeners that this has only been detected in Alaska so far, and no human to human transmission has been detected so far. Very good. Thanks for highlighting this again. And then you have a little bit more on on uh, Ebola. Yes. So um, this VSV EBOV vaccine has been a useful tool in battling Ebola outbreaks and is known for its high efficacy. But researchers who examined the impact on patients of this vaccine and Ebola treatment centers found that the vaccine also helped protect against death. So this is a retrospective cohort study led by researchers from Doctors Without Borders and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. They look at patients who were admitted to Ebola health facilities during the, the 10th outbreak, which occurred between July 2018 and April 2020. So this was uh, this ended uh, right before COVID became a big problem worldwide. Um, and they published their findings in The Lancet Infectious Diseases. The outbreak centered in North Kivu and Ituri provinces. And they use this um, method called ring vaccination where, where they um, vaccinate people who were known to have been in contact with those who are um, sick or have been exposed, right? And this was conducted in, um, in those provinces in, in the DRC. And yeah, so the, the vaccine was 100% effective. So it's really good to know that in outbreaks, we can use this vaccine in, in the future. Would you happen to remember how many vaccinees and how many non-vaccinated um, cluster people were contacts to patients? Would we know that? Just can, can, do you have an impression on the numbers no. behind? Okay. No. Okay. Uh -huh. But very interesting. I mean, it's good news overall. Look, if you have a vaccine that prevents the first death in rabies, that looks that that is unbelievable. Well, right. If it prevents two and three more consecutive patients, you don't need a clinical double blind randomized study. And with this highly deadly disease, uh, if you if you can show uh, on in, in, even in a cluster randomized study or in a not so well randomized study that you prevent 100 percent of cases, this is unbelievable. Right. So this is this is really, really a good, uh, good piece of information. And you have some yes. more information on the Ebola itself, right? Yes, so this is just a, a review basically of, of Ebola virus and how it spreads through contact, such as uh, through bro broken skin or mucous membranes in the eyes, nose, or mouth, or with body or body fluids, um, objects contaminated with body fluids, 
um, infected fruit bats or non-human primates such as apes and monkeys, and semen from men who recovered from Ebola disease uh, are known to also um, be uh, have the ability to infect other people. Um, and there is no evidence that Ebola virus can spread through sex, but those people who recovered from uh, Ebola disease could still uh, infect other people with, with semen through oral, vaginal, or anal sex. Wow. Very nice summary slide on uh, here from the CDC. And again, we, we spoke about the vaccine and the efficacy of the vaccine. What I'm covering today uh, is uh, adverse events of COVID vaccines. What you see here, I'm sorry, what you see here is the different platforms that we have available for COVID vaccines. And basically all that have been used uh, largely in populations, they have been shown to be associated with facial paralysis or Bell's palsy with activation of the clotting system and with myocarditis. Now, the issue is with adverse events, even in an efficacy study, the number of subjects included in an efficacy study may be too small to find rare, severe adverse events. And that is certainly a shortcoming. You want to be quick. You cannot include 100,000 subjects. So you do what you need to show efficacy and some safety data. But again, once you have population-based data, you just have a bigger database and you can find more. Today, I'm going to concentrate on facial paralysis or specifically Bell's palsy. And here, that may occur after COVID infection and also after COVID vaccination. And I looked at the data and I found two relevant studies here. I begin with showing you what Bell's palsy is. The facial nerve is um, no longer working. There are no wrinkles on your forehead, drooping eyelid, you cannot close your eye, inability to puff cheek, and you have an asymmetrical smile. There's a dropping corner of your mouth, and you have a dry mouth, and you basically, you cannot eat well, right? Like it is very difficult to eat. Bell's palsy after SARS-CoV-2 vaccination is usually mild and self-limited, so the prognosis is quite good. But anyway, this is something you don't want, and the big question is, does COVID vaccination uh, cause Bell's palsy. Now, first, what we had is observational data, and this is from a, uh, a summary of a meta-analysis of uh, publications where people looked into the frequency of Bell's palsy following first, second dose of vaccinations or AstraZeneca versus Sinovac, Pfizer, BioNTech, Janssen, Moderna vaccines. And you see here, depending on the study, you find a different incidence of Bell's palsy after vaccination, ranging from 6.3 to 278.1 in observational studies. And you see there are millions of people in here, right? So 687 million people included in a study. And then you find these rare side effects, but you cannot find them if you have 30, 40,000 subjects in your study. Now, I found one other nice publication, um, and that is looking at different studies and study types, and I highly recommend it uh, you for reading it yourself. What they did is, first of all, they looked, all, uh, they looked for Bell palsy after vaccination with COVID vaccine from randomized clinical studies. And if you sum up all the different data in participants in the vaccine group and in the placebo group, all of a sudden, a non-significant finding becomes a significant finding. So the story is data from double-blind randomized studies. They indicate that Bell's palsy is associated with a slightly elevated risk for Bell's palsy. But that's not the full story. Here is the full story. If you go to unvaccinated patients, then what you see is the unvaccinated have a higher risk of getting Bell's palsy than the vaccinated, which is a contradiction, right? If the vaccinated, if, if, if vaccine causes Bell's palsy, how can the unvaccinated have um, a higher frequency of Bell's palsy? The story is an easy explanation. COVID infection causes Bell's palsy. And vaccination may cause an additional little increase but it prevents Bell's palsy. 
versus infection. And this is exactly shown in this third analysis from observational study in this very nice publication, what you see here, that those who have SARS-CoV-2 SARS -CoV vaccine on the left side versus uh, those who had the infection, very clearly the infection increases the risk. And actually this is 3.23 fold higher. I, I think this is very nicely done, a very nice summary. I had been looking for this all the time, and now I found it. So what I can say is, if you worry about Bell's palsy after vaccination, you uh, you should get the vaccine because the risk for uh, Bell's palsy is much higher from infection than after vaccination, and vaccination prevents Bell's palsy. And again, this is summarized here in our conclusion. Observational studies show that there is no significant increase in Bell's palsy in the unvaccinated, uh, um, in, there is no significant increase in the incidence versus the unvaccinated. This study shows that uh, Bell's palsy is a result of COVID vaccine exposure from double-blind randomized trials, but overall vaccination reduces the risk 3.23 times versus infection. That is the main message here. And I think this is really nicely done. I really like this publication. It is not so easy to understand, but uh, if you see the data and the conclusion, it is very clear. Now then, any questions or concerns here on this one? No, I, I think it's just, it's important for people to understand that yes, vaccination for SARS-CoV-2 causes uh, increased risk of Bell's palsy, but infection for SARS-CoV-2 has a much higher risk. Yeah. And I think that has been the case with other uh, adverse events as well, but it, it's it's difficult because people don't look at the whole picture, right? Yeah. Um, especially on, on social media and anti-vaxxers would focus on, oh yeah, but it causes Bell's palsy, right? And, and period, they don't yeah. give you the whole context. So yeah. when you get all these messages where they don't give you the whole picture, basically that's um, untrue, right? Because yeah. it's a, it's a it's a way for these people who are anti-vax to destroy the, um, the messaging, the public health messaging, and the yeah. confidence. Yeah. Very nice. And next week, we're going to cover another adverse event of COVID vaccination. And this was our story today. Melvin showed you that mild flu increases the risk of heart attack and stroke in older subjects. He spoke about one, the first fatal case of Alaska, pack, uh, uh, Alaska pox in a man undergoing cancer treatment. Uh, we spoke about Ebola vaccine, 100% effective in a study in the Democratic Republic of Congo during an outbreak. Then I covered vaccine-specific adverse events today of COVID vaccines, and I showed you that Bell's palsy is, uh, has a reduced risk of vaccination versus infection. So I think this is good news as well. And again, if you want to know the update of the CDC vaccination recommendations, have a look at the new schedule that you can find online. Melvin, as always, you have the last word. Yes, so I just wanted to show this. This is from the New Scientist. Uh, and this is funny, right? Because we always see cartoon about being optimist, half full, pessimist is half empty. But when you say chemist, you, you, you see H2O. And then if you say a pessimistic chemist, you have um, H2SO4 and the nitrogen and oxygen. But if you talk about an optimistic chemist, you have uh, nitrogen, oxygen, and tequila. So. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So very nice uh, and very nice cartoon. Thank you for finding it for us. With this, this is the end of our Global Health Cast 60 today. We hope to see you again next week. Please leave your comments below. Thank you very much. I am Joe Schmidt. And I'm Melvin Sanikas. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe.